Um, in this next session, uh, we, we sort of move from the, the light side over to the dark side um, with a very different shift of emphasis and tone as we open up briefly together this whole domain of pornography, um, the printed or visual material containing explicit description or display of sexual organs or activity intended, intended to promote or stimulate sexual excitement. That's our working definition of pornography and that's what we're going to explore together just now. I want to begin by making two brief observations, recapping a little on what Richard just said and what we were talking about last night. Two observations. First of all, uh, we've noted a, that we're participants in a broad cultural shift of understanding about the role of the body in shaping our concept of identity. In other words, over the past few decades, we have seen profound shifts of cultural understandings of identity and changes in the way we experience and understand our bodies has played a key part in that. We noted the rise of expressive individualism as a defining feature of our culture, that self-understanding identity is pursued from within. You look within yourself to the inner you, the real you, which you then express as the definition of who you fundamentally and ultimately are. And we noted this commits us to a project of open-ended, ultimately groundless self-making with no end, in which the self looks inside itself, devoid of other grounds of understanding, to understand and define itself. A project of self-definition freed, unencumbered by dogma, tradition, authorities, indeed freed from reality itself, if necessary. And that freeing from reality in our self-understanding includes the reality of our own bodies. And we, we, we saw some extreme examples of this uh, last night. Let me describe um, a couple more. Um, this man was reported in the Canadian uh, media a couple of years back. He, he, I think he's a 57-year-old man who identifies as transgender, who left his wife and six children in order to become a woman, but actually not just a woman, but a little girl of age seven, because that was who he felt he truly was. So we're introduced to the sphere here of not only transgender, but transageism, in which the inner self redefines one's own chronology in line with one's inner sense of identity. Because that is who I am. And this couple took him in sort of adoption, it wasn't a formal adoption, but they, they took him in because they said, we want to help him be who he really is. And then there's Rachel Dolezal we talked about, black civil rights activists outed by her parents, and they say, this is our little girl, not this woman who is masquerading. Now, clearly there were some family dynamics there, but Rachel Dolezal says, I still identify as black. And so we have transgender giving way to trans-ageism, giving way to trans-racialism. And we also see trans-speciesism in which people speak of feeling themselves to be really another kind of animal. Now, these are outliers, these are extreme examples. Now, I, I pose these examples not to mock or humiliate these 
people made in the image of God, loved by God. Um, and I, I, th- I'm, this isn't about mocking these people, and, and it's simply their story as reported, and we don't know what the real facts are or the complexities behind them. But we, we tell these stories because although they're outliers and extreme examples, they are typical of an underlying shift of culture, which is quite profound, that you say who you are, the imperialism of the self, the the imperialism, the authority over reality. And if reality doesn't line up, we redefine reality, including that of our own bodies. And of course, this isn't a particularly new phenomenon, but we we find it's an iteration of old ways of thinking, perhaps the most stark example of which is Gnosticism, ancient Gnosticism, one of Christianity's most potent opponents, in which the the inner light was seen as trumping all of reality, in which the body itself was viewed as hostile, the flesh is hostile to the spirit, and therefore the project of enlightenment, of Gnosis, is to be freed of the body. And so this modern project of self-making isn't particularly new in the sense that it's been witnessed before in different forms of which Gnosticism is one. Indeed, the theologian Tom Wright says Gnosticism is a defining myth of our age. So that's the first general observation I want to make. The second is that this project of self-making underscores, um, or is one of the, uh, sorry, this project of of self-making is a, a, a disembodiment, which is one of multiple separations that are the hallmark of the sexual revolu- revelation. So we see disembodiment with identity, fluidity, and virtual sex, separation of the self and sex from its own body, procreation, sex separated from procreation by abortion and contraception, sex separated from marriage by cohabitation, sex separated from partnership by hookup culture, separated from interpersonality by what we're looking about today, which is pornography. And so let's just think a little more about this phenomenon of pornography within that context of separation of sex from the personal, from its own body. And um, Richard introduced us to some of the data last night. In fact, there there, there are various data that, that you will find banded around. The reality is it's very hard to get people to be honest about what the real use of these kind of resources is. If somebody knocks on your door with a clipboard and says, could I talk to you about your most intimate sex life? Are you going to say, come in, I'd love to do that? Of course not. So although there are sophisticated methods of eliciting these data, you always need a pinch of salt. But one in five mobile searches for pornography, first age of internet exposure to pornography, age nine to 11, it's earlier for boys. 90% of eight to 16 year olds have viewed porn. 68% of young adult men, 18% of women use porn at least once a week. 40 to 60, 40% of 60 year olds. This isn't simply a young phenomena of 60 year olds have viewed pornography in the past month. We have witnessed the pornographication of culture and the pornographication of childhood. One of my points about the sexual revolution and it's the failed promise of the sexual revolution is that we, to our shame, shame childhood and our children's understanding of their sexuality and their sexual development. What the sexual revolution did in its reaction to that was it pornographied childhood. And that's the phenomenon that we witness today. 64% of Christian men and 15% of Christian women say they watch porn at least once a month. 
Regular church, this is according to statistics from Covenant Eyes summarised, regular church attendees 26% less likely to look at porn. However, and this will be this American phenomenon of identifying oneself as a born-again Christian in a notional way rather than, than in a committed sense that we would understand it. There's some data that these kind of um, notional um, Christians are, are more likely to look at porn, but I, I, we, could, we could talk about, about these kinds of data, but they give us a picture of the scale of what we are talking about. Well, let's try and think a little more about the, the phenomenon as a whole and some of the consequences of pornography. Um, there's three broad perspectives that we could think about. I hope you've all got the outline, by the way, that was sent around when you signed up for this. You should have a two-page outline, and I'm following that at the moment. Um, first of all, there's a biological perspective. Um, we are, in our embodiment, we are, of course, able to measure now, to observe how the brain itself changes by the choices we make, the things we seek, the things we do. Um, and um, I suppose the London taxi driver experiment is still an iconic example of this, and it's one of the very earliest examples. I mean, it's now 15 years out of date, but it's a good example of how the choices we make, the lives we live, is reflected in in the way our brains work and what can be observed about that on, say, brain imaging. And what this study did was to take a group of London taxi drivers and to measure um, the activity of their brain using uh, MRI scanning. And uh, they found that in this group of people, um, an area in the brain that deals with mapping, the posterior part of what's called the hippocampus on the left, was larger in these people compared to age, sex, social class matched controls. And so it seems that the process of mapping London is embodied in measurable difference of size of that part of the brain which deals with this area. But you might say, aha, but that doesn't mean that taxi driving causes the brain to change in this way. It may be that people who are naturally uh, given a, a greater capacity, have just got a bigger capacity in this area, go into taxi driving. And you're thinking, I wouldn't go into taxi driving because my brain's pretty small when it comes to mapping. Um, that may be true, except that they found that the longer you'd been taxi driving, the bigger this part of the brain was, which isn't absolutely conclusive, but it's pretty suggestive that it's the activity itself which causes the brain to change. And as we make choices as human beings, those choices result in the strengthening of connections in our brain and the reinforcing of certain circuits in our brain. And one of the most important circuits are what are called the brain reward pleasure systems. And these systems direct us toward and reinforce us things that keep us alive. Appetite, water, relationships, and of course that su ensure survival, which is sex. So we are built in ways which dispose us to, to these pleasurable activities that also sustain our lives, help us survive. And underpinning these are complex neurochemical mechanisms mediated particularly by a transmitter called dopamine and at another level endorphins. Now we don't have time to go into the detail of this. I, I give some references of books that deal with this, particularly Struthers' book, Wired for Intimacy, How Pornography Hijacks the Minds, a very good book that summarizes many of these findings. But basically, as we view pornography, we ratchet up these reward systems. 
We ratchet up their activity. And the way they operate is that once you're satisfied with a particular reward, whether it's a lovely meal or a drink, um, those, those systems create a feedback loop which, which leads you to desire more in the future, which leads you back to that thing. And the problem with porn is because it, be, because it, it, it kind of, um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? Because it exposes us so quickly to powerful stimuli, pleasurable stimuli, it ratchets up those reward-seeking mechanisms of dopamine so that once we've left the porn, already our, our brain is building up the process of seeking it once again. So that reward, pleasure, reward-seeking mechanisms are ratcheted up by the activity itself. And this is the underpinning of addictive behavior, of course. So there are some interesting and growing data available about how porn changes the brain, which makes it harder for us to stop doing it. That's the very briefly the biological. Then we have these behavioral addictive patterns. Once we get into certain patterns of behavior, it becomes hard to break them. Um, we have a narrowing of the range of desire. We have a tolerance developing so that we find that we need um, greater exposure to get the same effect, just as an alcoholic needs more alcohol to get the same effect. So with pornography, people tend to get drawn into more extreme forms. Um, you get the classic withdrawal effects, which is when you try to resist those siren calls of pornography, the brain mechanisms that have been ratcheted up, the pleasure-seeking dopamine-mediated magazine, ratcheted up, drive us back to them and create a sense of discomfort, and withdrawal pain if we try to resist that. And the impact um, on social, occupational, relational goals, which become all subservient to the goal of seeking pornography. All of these are similar to what we see in other addictions, gambling addiction, alcohol addiction. And so pornography addiction does fit in in terms of its broad uh, effect on our behavior across a number of areas with these other addictive patterns, behavioral insights. And then we have the relational consequences, the numbing of intimacy, um, that is relational intimacy, is numbed because of course um, fast food is so much more immediately rewarding than placing your order with the waiter, getting your soup first as you wait for the next course to come. All of this leaves you out of control and we all know what it's like to sit in a restaurant thinking, well, where's my second course? You know, they took my soup away 15 minutes ago and I'm out of control here. But because I'm paying, I'm now a little annoyed. So I'm beginning to call over the waitress because this is my meal. And, and fast food, you see, subverts all of that and gets you to the burger and to the chips and then to the ice cream very, very quickly, and so it satisfies our desires, but the speed of satisfaction ratchets up those desires for more in future. And so slow sex, intimate sex, the building up of the relational context of sex, the love making, the affection, are bypassed in the search for the ultimate reward. And this creates a number of relational consequences around deception and secretiveness as I build this private world of pleasure and reward around myself. Those are some of the dangers and some of the features of what we understand as pornography. Well, how does the Bible understand this? What's the biblical perspective on this? Well, very briefly, I think there are three broad biblical perspectives, ways of understanding pornography. The idolatry of self, the origins of lust, and pornography as disordered desire. Let's take first of all the 
idolatry of self. Do you remember in Genesis 3, chapter 4, the offer that the serpent makes to the woman is this, you will not certainly die, she says. He's, the serpent says, for God knows that when you eat from the tree, your eyes will be opened, and here's the offer, and you will be as gods, like God, knowing good and evil. Now, what is so bizarre about this is that he's offering what they already have. They're already like God, God-like in the image of God. But the extra twist here is that you shall know good and evil. And the best way to understand that is that you get to define the boundaries of good and evil. You get to make the rules. You become godlike with this extra twist that he doesn't tell you that there's a tree that you can't eat. You decide what you shall eat. And so in Genesis, we have the origins of the idolatry of self. I define myself as. I define reality as. I make reality, including the reality of my own being. And pornography surely fits into that paradigm in that it puts us in control of our lovemaking. There's no problem with your partner having a headache or not wanting sex tonight or needing arousing or spending all that time you know, lovemaking in the build-up. This puts me in control that I press the button and I decide what I will access tonight and how my sexual desire will be satisfied. The idolatry, the self. And so going back to this notion of sin as taking the things of this world but using them for the wrong purposes, we're led on to disordered desire, Romans 1, 21, 22. If you remember, Paul says this, for Romans 1, 21, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they knew God, they didn't, they didn't give God the glory due to him, but became darkened and exchanged the glory of God for images made to look like them, like mortals. And so in pornography, you see, I take God's good gift of sex and I appropriate it for myself my reality, my control, my satisfaction. Now there's lots more we could say about this, isn't there? But it, it isn't hard to understand what's going on here when we look at it through those lens. Well, how do we seek to help people caught up in this in this sin, in this disorder of our desire. I want to suggest basically there are, there are three big headings. I think, you know, this one is perhaps the most, sometimes I think maybe this is the most important. Ownership. In other words, I take ownership of, of what I do of the choices I make. You think, well, what, help me understand what, what you're meaning by this. I mean, obviously, if someone confesses to you that this is a, a real issue and a real problem for them, they they've got ownership of it. That is not true. You, if you talk to people who are heavily involved with pornography, they'll often use the word zone. It's as if I enter a zone. I zone out and all I want to do at that point is to get into that screen and I separate myself from, from all other sense of experience to get into this zone. And it's quite important, therefore, to establish ownership of that zone. That isn't somebody else in that zone. 
that's you. That, there's, no, there's no other you over there that does this stuff. There's just you who does it. And so I tend to spend quite a lot of time helping somebody take ownership of what they do and what they choose. And it can be one of the most painful, difficult things for somebody to do. So I, Glyn Harrison, who, if this were me, Glyn Harrison, who, I give talks on this. Um, I write books. People listen to me and take advice. I, Glyn Harrison, married with a lovely wife, three children and five grandchildren. It's known as a Christian. I, Glyn Harrison, who's that little boy who grew up and, and we flesh this out. It's me now. I look at these women and many of them, this is not a confession by the way, this is an example. <laughs> But I look at these images, and I not only look at these images, but there's a part of me which likes to see women humiliated. And although I, Glyn Harrison, with my five grandchildren and my ministry, started off relatively light pornography, now I find it's the humiliation of women that I need to really get that satisfaction which I first had. And I, Glyn Harrison, now, and we, we spend quite a lot of time taking ownership of this because if we don't do this it becomes a problem to be solved over there rather than a heart to be renewed here and if we don't begin here this problem to be solved over there gets subject to all sorts of accountability measures you know we strap him this self to the mast as in we talked about last night in the siren calls. We, we link him up with, with uh, covenant eyes and, and accountability. And I, I look very stern and I say, next time you come, I'll know how many times you've looked at this. And this self over there is feeling very naughty. But the self here in the room with me is talking to me about this problem over there. No, we bring this self into the room. And it's the self who is here with Christ, in Christ, in the love of God, who is pursuing these things. And then finally, I, I think part of our confession is to do it in God's presence. Use the, spell out what we're doing, what I'm doing. Um, explain to the Lord what those pictures are, who, who the women might be, who are, who are being trafficked maybe, or used, or abusing themselves in this way, what their story might be, how they got into this, what damage is this doing to them. In other words, we personalize. This is all about reconnecting sex, you see, with people, with our bodies, with reality, and exploding this myth that you can detach sex because you can't. And the pornography industry, in its wake, leaves <laughs> damaged, hollowed out lives. And so acceptance, confession, and then a profound repentance is crucial to this. And then a reorientation. Because one of the, the problems with so many pornography talks is that we're, we, we finish in with, with, a, with a, an even more shameful view of sex. And not, a, not enough either talks nor enough understandings of this, seeing as this is a perversion of something that's good. We're taking God's good gifts and we're using them to wrong ends here. But the accountability helps with the wrong ends, but often what we don't do is restore the imagination around the good gift. And so what I was talking about last night, what Richard was just talking so inspiringly about, and I, I, I talk about it, just hearing Richard there, I thought, yes, tell me more of that. I want to hear that again, of how we embody Christ's love for the church. And we have to, if we want to help people, and people here, you're accessing pornography. We're not talking about people out there, we're talking about we here, as we struggle 
to hold one, to stay one click away, which is all that we are from this material. Accountability controls, strapping ourselves to the master is part of that, but we must all be captured by a better vision in which doing this stuff is just simply not enough anymore. It, our own heart begins to say we are selling the gospel short here. This is thin gruel for the glory of God. And so capturing our hearts again with the glory of God. And then finally, these pastoral measures, the shepherding measures, behavioral, they're important accountability. It's important that someone acknowledging the weakness of the flesh knows that they'll be coming back in a couple of weeks to tell you what's happened, to tell themselves what's happened. Counseling about some of the background factors, the hurts, the brokenness that can lead into pornography. And of course, rebuilding intimacy in the relationship with the spouse. They're all big and important areas. But I, I think the big take home message here is that we need to be captured by a better vision. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you.